Good evening, everybody. Hello. Hello. Uh, I don't have to read the first part. My name is Howie Schneider. Uh, I am the dean of the School of Journalism here at uh, Stony Brook University. And I want to welcome you all to the latest edition of a special lecture series that we call My Life As, which brings to campus some of the top journalists in the nation and even in the world. In the last 10 years, since the journalism school was launched, we have hosted more than 50 of those journalists, many of them Emmy Award winners, Pulitzer Prize winners, ranging from Bob Woodward to Christiana Amanpour, from Dean Bacay, who was the editor of the New York Times, to Ted Koppel. But tonight's guest, Margaret Sullivan, may be unique in the following way. She has had a very distinguished career as a journalist, as a reporter and an editor, but for the last six years, she's had a special mission. She has been reporting on the news media itself. She's reporting on how well the media does its job or doesn't do its job. She's trying to hold reporters and editors accountable for how they make their decisions. She's done it as the public editor, the reader's advocate, the reader's representative at the New York Times. And for the last two years, she's been the media columnist for the Washington Post. So she's done this work from the perch of the two most powerful newspapers in America, in perhaps the world. So she has, I think, a real special perspective on how the press is performing. And we're going to talk to her tonight about those issues how well the press does or doesn't do. Margaret is a daughter of Western New York. She grew up in Lackawanna in the Buffalo area. She has degrees from Georgetown and the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern. Um, she interned at her hometown newspaper, the Buffalo News, and rose over time to become the first woman managing editor and then editor-in-chief of that newspaper. I think, Margaret, it was in 2000 that yes. you became editor. She was only one of 12 women who headed major American newspapers at that point, and I don't think that number has changed very much in the last 18 years. In 2012, she left the Buffalo News to become the public editor of the New York Times, where she was in charge of responding to readers' complaints and questions about how those journalists work. And she had allegedly had access to interview the reporters and the editors at the Times to get those answers, and she reported directly to the publisher of the New York Times. She was, in effect, a watchdog of the watchdog. And we'll hear tonight from Margaret about what that experience was like. Um, and then she joined the Post. I have a confession to make. I have tried for several years to allure Margaret here to speak. But now I'm happy we waited. I'm very happy we waited. I can think of no more appropriate time for her to be here than in the midst of one of the tumultuous periods in the history of the Republic and the news media in many respects. So ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in welcoming to Stony Brook, Margaret Sullivan. Thank you very much. How's my sound? Good. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me. I have not been to Stony Brook before, and I've not really been to Long Island very much. So um, this is a, a great experience for me to be here. And um, I'm, I'm eager to talk to you about whatever you want to talk about concerning the news media or the news business. Um, but I will start off by telling you a, a little bit about my experience um, in the, in the all-new world of dealing with President Trump because it is, uh, it is a, a highly uh, fraught and um, certainly a historic time for the news media. And I know that you all know some of this, um, but uh, I've had a front row seat at it, and uh, it's been a pretty wild ride, I have to say. When I left the New York Times, where I was the public editor, 
uh, and joined the Post, the Post uh, editor, you know, I really love New York City. Uh, and I, I didn't really want to leave, but the Post thought it would be a good idea, and it really, of course, was for me to at least spend a year in Washington and then perhaps come back and do my work from New York City. So I, I went down to Washington in the spring of 2016. So, you know, the presidential primaries were happening, and but, you know, I was writing about all kinds of different media issues at first. I was writing about Facebook, and I was writing about news literacy, and then it got to be the summer, and I went to the two political conventions. And, uh, and Hillary became the nominee for the Democrats, and Donald Trump became the Republican nominee for president. And pretty much since then, my job has been all Trump all the time. I mean, it, it really has been such an incredibly dominant story, um, and it's been such an important story for the news media because the president has such a strange relationship with the news media. And so it is paradoxical in many ways. Um, you know, as you undoubtedly know, the president commonly talks about the news media as the enemy of the people. And he'll say at his rallies and point to the press pen and say, these are very dishonest, terrible people. He's referred to reporters as the scum of the earth. Um, you know, really vicious and, and difficult language. And yet, so here's the paradoxical part, he actually loves the press in many ways. He thrives on the attention. He enjoys the interplay with reporters. He knows how to work the media. And, um, you know, in his recent press conference, which was the first one he had had in a long time, he just kept going and going and going. And, we, we, you know, watching it, you would just say, he's having a wonderful time. You know, fielding questions, teasing reporters, in some cases insulting them, um, but always uh, thriving, I think, on that attention. So there's a real paradox there. And another paradox uh, of, of President Trump's is that while he says he hates the news media and says that they're terrible and plays to his base by saying how bad these people are, he also is actually much more accessible than a lot of other presidents have been. So that he, you know, does informal, sometimes off the record or background chats with people. He walks back on Air Force One to talk with reporters. He, he really wants that attention on himself. And again, he's good at it. You know, he's kind of very, very good at sort of managing that. And, um, you know, and, and so he kind, of, he kind of plays it both ways. And, you know, for those of us who resent the fact that he has portrayed, I think, hardworking and honest journalists in such, in such difficult terms, some people say, you know, okay, but he hasn't really hurt you. He hasn't really done anything. And arguably, President Obama, who used the Espionage Act to go after leakers, and in some cases to also persecute journalists who used those leaks, maybe Obama, you know, for all of his apparently nice, kind, liberal values, maybe he was actually worse with the press than Trump was. So it is very paradoxical. I, I, I do think that the president's criticism of the press and his apparent um, disregard for the role of the watchdog press has hurt us, has hurt us internationally and I think even the country um, internationally because it seems to give vent to those who would say, well, freedom of expression and freedom of speech isn't that important, but it's hard to pin it down. So um, it's been an endless sort of um, font of stories. Um, I write a column, so I get to have an opinion, which is nice because for many years I was a regular reporter and I, I didn't, I mean, I might have an opinion, but I didn't really give vent to it. And then as an editor, I didn't, certainly didn't talk about my politics and tried to keep my politics out of it and all that. These days I actually feel a little more free um, because I get to have an opinion in print. And 
I try to bring fairness to it, but at the same time, I'm able to call things as I see them, and that is, um, it's very, very freeing. One of the issues that we've had covering Trump is what to do about his many misstatements. Um, are we going, how are we going to refer to these, you know, he, he, he's, not, uh, he's not someone who sticks closely to facts, reality, or the truth. Um, <laughs> And, and so, you know, there's been sort of a, a journalistic debate. How are we going to talk about this? Because if, are we going to use the word lie in news stories? And journalists uh, at organizations like the New York Times and the Washington Post have been very reluctant um, to use that word because it's a very strong word. It can come off as, um, as biased against the president, even if it's seems to be true, and it also seems to assume that there's intent. You know, if you lie, that means you meant to lie. Um, however, there, there comes a point when, you know, the facts are the facts, and if you repeat something opposite to them enough times, you know, people have gotten somewhat more comfortable at times using that word. But it's still something that's been a big debate among, uh, among journalists, and maybe more than it should be. Um, so another issue that has come up in this period has been the use of anonymous sources, uh, because the White House is a very, the Trump White House is a very leaky White House. It's, uh, it has not been difficult for reporters to find their sources and give them stories, whether it's about what's happening on the, at, you know, a palace intrigue, what's happening at the staff level, or what's happening uh, in, in all kinds of ways about immigration and foreign affairs and all of that. But these stories are attributed to a knowledgeable source. You know, who, well, who is a knowledgeable source? And then the president himself will say, you can't believe those stories because those sources are made up. And something that I've come to realize, and this is maybe a little piece of news literacy for people, is that when we talk about anonymous sources or when people refer to anonymous sources, very often news consumers think that that means that even the reporters themselves don't know who these people are, that they're anonymous to us. Well, th this is not the case. And most news organizations like the Times and the Post have fairly uh, clear rules that if you are going to use an anonymous source, your editor needs to know who that person is behind the source, behind that nameless source. But nevertheless, I think that it cuts into our credibility when we use anonymous sources too much, and I think we should do less of it. But it's almost an addiction among reporters to get their stories, to get that access uh, to the powerful people, and to protect them by allowing them to speak anonymously. So, um, you know, uh, we have a midterms coming in three weeks from today. It's going to be very interesting. Uh, and I think as soon as the midterms are over, if not before, we're going to see the presidential campaign gear up in earnest. So um, this whole subject is not going to calm down or go away. You know, we've had some crazy uh, news events. It seems as though every week you get to about Tuesday and you say, thank God it's Friday. You know, every week is so packed with news that it's exhausting. And actually, I've heard a number of reporters say this, no longer is there a weekend or even, you know, a, a lid on things where the news is over for the day. It never, ever stops. So it's been relentless. It's been fascinating. Uh, from my point of view, it's been a fantastic opportunity to write about the things that I care about, which have to do with how people can trust the news media, how reporters and editors can engender that trust, um, you know, how the media can do better, because I don't think we've done a great job of covering Trump. We don't seem to know how to cover him very well, and we're scrambling. Um, and to get better at it because it matters an awful lot to our democracy um, how well we do our jobs and how well people think we're doing our jobs. 
So um, there's a ton to talk about, but I thought that it would be good to take some questions from the dean and then go to your questions too, because I always find that to be more interesting and more fun. So. <laughs> no, your part will be the most oh, interesting. I know, I know, I know. I know. Come, come sit down, okay. Margaret. So as Margaret said, we're going to just talk for a few minutes, and then we're going to throw it open for a lot of questions. Let's start with uh, what you said about the midterm elections will be over, we'll have another presidential election. Tell us about how well the press performed in 2016, and what lessons, if any, did the press, the press learn about uh, covering uh, the presidential race and what you think might change? Well, the, the, the campaign itself, uh, the coverage was flawed in that we didn't take Donald Trump seriously enough during the primary. Uh, not at all. People thought, many journalists thought it, that it was kind of a sideshow and kind of a joke. How could this reality TV star who had no political experience, no military experience, um, but had been a developer and a businessman in New York City, how could he possibly be president? Um, you know, because many journalists thought that it wouldn't be a good idea for him to be president, they somehow transmuted that into, and therefore he can't be president. And so, uh, the poll numbers certainly seem to favor Hillary Clinton, uh, and some things that should have been factored in never really were. So we did not do a good job during the campaign of understanding that Trump could win, and in fact, would win. <laughs> and so uh, election night was quite a shocker for a lot of journalists, a real shock. Many, uh, many journalists and news organizations thought they knew what was going to happen that night. Um, and I include myself in that number. Um, I had a column idea. I was at the post office and in the newsroom in, in Washington and I had a column idea prepared and it was not about Donald Trump winning. Um, and so, you know, everybody was throwing out everything they had. And, um, and I think from that moment on, we've been scrambling. Let me ask you a question. Did anybody go into a voting booth and not know those two candidates well? And the substance of the coverage, what the press actually covered, was anybody unprepared to make that decision based on what they read and watched? No, I think they, I think they knew who the candidates were. Um, I, you know, the Washington, people say to me, well, if you guys know so much about Donald Trump now, why didn't you tell us before? And, that's, and that sounds good, but it's actually not true. Um, the Washington Post reporters did a, a whole book uh, called Trump Revealed that was published in August of 2016 and excerpted it in the paper. Uh, the Times did a lot of great reporting too. I mean, we knew who Trump was, I think, pretty much. Um, I think the coverage was driven too much by the idea that Hillary was invulnerable. And, and the people who are Hillary supporters will say that press coverage was unfair, yeah. email, the, the controversy over the email overblown, and that that hurt her, and in many ways may have influenced the election. True or false in your view? I agree with that. I think, there's, I think that there was what, what people, the shorthand for it is false equivalency. You know, the, Trump had a lot in his background to examine. Um, you know, casinos that had gone bankrupt, uh, business deals, um, Trump University, you know, all of that stuff. There was a lot to say about him. And in order to kind of seem fair, well, you needed to find something that was, the feeling was, that you needed to find something to kind of even it out. And the, the something was the email scandal. Now, there was a real issue there, in my mind. I mean, I think that she did something that wasn't, wasn't right. But, you know, it was, I think, overblown. And it was, there was an effort to kind of even them up. And then when, when James Comey came out with his October surprise, um, that story, I think, was overblown. And, you know, Nate Silver, who I interviewed yesterday, um, has said that he thought that Comey's uh, last minute, you know, uh, we're reopening the investigation of Hillary Clinton, that it actually, 
he thinks it was a major factor in her loss. So what do you think is going to change in 2020? What do you expect? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't mean about the results of the election. I'm talking about the coverage. Right. W will there be major changes in your view in some ways? Of the, ca of the campaign? Yeah. I mean, it sort of depends who the candidates are. I mean, we, we now truly know. I mean, it also it depends a lot on what happens with the Mueller investigation. Um, how is that going to affect things? There's a lot of moving parts here. Um, I, you know, it's hard to predict it. I, I don't know that there's been a great deal of soul searching. I don't believe there's been a great deal of soul searching about what went wrong, what could have been done better. I mean, I know that the Shorenstein Center at Harvard did a, did a, a session on it. Um, I've written about it some, so have some other people, but I don't think that news organizations have actually done uh, what, you know, in my Catholic uh, upbringing would have been an examination of conscience. Nope. Let's talk about the substance from the point of view of the president. So the president feels that coverage of his administration has been unfair. He yes. doesn't get credit. Um, it, there's a negative bias. Um, um, is there any truth to it, in your view, watching the press and his co the coverage of the president? You know, I do think there probably is there's something to that. Um, sometimes I look at the major news sites, and it seems as though every headline, you know, if I look at the homepage, every headline is about Trump. Every headline is, an, you know, they, especially if the opinion content is kind of mixed in with the news content, so, uh, you know, you can't really tell the difference. Um, I, yeah, it comes off as, as a, a, a sort of a groundswell um, of negative coverage. Now, is, it, are, is each one of those stories or opinion pieces solid on its own? You know, maybe so. But does it add up to something greater than the, than the sum of its parts? I think it might. So what would you do differently? If you were well, still running the, if you were running the Washington Post, what would you well, do Well, I would do nothing different than my boss. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I really actually, that, that's a joke, but, um, but I actually hugely admire Marty Barron, who's the executive editor of the Washington Post. I mean, sincerely, I, I have great admiration for him and his news judgment. Um, one thing that I think is a, is a problem across media is the blending of news and opinion. And I often, I've talked to a lot of people, a lot of news consumers, regular citizens, you know, what would you like to see different? And they often will say, I wish you could just give me the facts and let me draw my own conclusions and stop shoving opinions down my throat. And I think one of the reasons they think that is because we don't differentiate as well as we should in labeling, in placement. I mean, of course, if you read the print paper, then you know you're going to read news stories and you're going to get to the opinion section and then you're going to go on to the feature sections or whatever it may be. But if you're reading on your phone or your laptop, everything is disaggregated. And so what comes across your phone may not, you may not say, oh, this is an opinion piece, you know, or this is a news piece. And I think one of the things that we could do is label, this is a small thing, but I think we could label better. And one of the things that happened for me over the past year or so is that, you know, again, I mentioned I write an opinion column. And people would say, you know, read my columns. And they would write to me, enraged. And they would say, how dare you have an opinion? And I would write back and say, well, you know what? I'm actually a columnist, and it's part of my job description. I'm supposed to have an opinion. So one of the things that the Post started doing not too long ago is labeling each, um, each piece of content. So my thing says perspective on it. And if you hover over the word perspective, it says perspective, in which you know the reporter or the, the writer has an opinion, and including a personal narrative or something. And honestly, I can say that once that happened, there did seem to be greater understanding. So I think that labeling and explaining ourselves to people is important. So we haven't done a very good job of explaining how journalism works no, to the public. Not let, at me, all. let me ask you about this, I, this war business, uh, and whether it's just political, and the president declaring war on the news media, and your boss, the editor of the Washington Post, said, we're not going to war, we just go to work every day. And yet, it looks like if you, I'm going to read you some numbers here, that the president is winning this war in terms of how the public views the, the news media. A recent political poll shows that um, 
More than half of Americans now believe that the news media totally fabricates news about the president or his administration. 76% of Republicans, 46% of independents, and 20% of Democrats now believe the news media is making stuff up. So what's going on? Well, you know, I mean, the rhetoric coming from the White House and elsewhere about fake news has had an effect. And there's an effort, I think, to say, um, we're going to say it's fake so that it's a sort of inoculation against bad news. <clears throat> so when something like, for example, the Mueller investigation comes to fruition and there's a lot of bad stuff in it, we can say, well, you know, you can't believe that anyway. It's all part of the deep state and the elite media ganging up on me. So I think that, you know, that, that rhetoric um, has had an effect, and I think it's been destructive. However, I think that people really depend on the news media to get, you know, they need to know what's going on, and we all understand that. And the one thing that those polls that you're quoting all say is that if you ask people about the watchdog role of the press, they will all say they think that's very important. They understand that there's an accountability function of, of the news media, that if we did not have it, you know, our town councils and our city halls and our Congress and our executive branch would be running even wilder than they are now. And, and when we start to see news deserts forming in this country, uh, because newspapers are going out of business um, and, and there's a lot of areas that aren't even getting any news coverage, you can be sure that corruption will flourish in those places because there's no one watching the store. So um, I think people may say, oh, it's all made up stuff. I'm not sure that they, I mean, based on my conversations with, with individual news consumers, I think some of that is uh, exaggerated. So let's talk about one of the ways in which the news media has tried to adjust to the president, and that's through fact-checking, right? More and more news organizations, this is not new, have been fact-checking and fact-checking and fact-checking. The question is, is it having much impact? Is it an effective way? I mean, obviously, it's something that needs to be done. Right. Yet a third of all Americans, a third of all Americans still believe that President Obama probably or definitely was born in Kenya. A third of Americans, more than half of Republicans, but independents and Democrats still believe that. Well, what can be, so I'm gonna read you a question from a student. I'm gonna to try to throw in some student questions mm -hmm. and we're gonna get more student questions. One student question says to Margaret, and you'll see more of what Margaret advice, we're gonna end with her advice to you about being a news consumer. You say that people should always seek out commentary from the opposite viewpoint or side. However, some people are absolutely dead set in their ways and beliefs. What can you suggest to make even the most stubborn person have an open mind when it comes to the news? Right. Well, what, what actually doesn't work is presenting, I mean, I'm sorry to say this, but what doesn't work is presenting them with endless arguments in support of your own position, which opposes theirs. What, what what probably does work and what I've read is actually effective if you're trying to change someone's mind about something is that someone they have trust in, one of their Facebook friends, one of their, you know, someone they respect might offer that as an opinion. Um, I think that fact checking is important. I mean, I have tremendous respect for Glenn Kessler, my colleague who writes the fact checker column at at the Washington Post. I mean, it's a hard and necessary job, and I turn to what he does with great, you know, need. But does it change people's minds about the president? Does it change people's minds about Congress? No, I, I don't. I don't think it does. So, you know, we need to do it, and it doesn't really um, effectively counter the misinformation and disinformation that's circulating out there, including, and, and I think in a huge way, on social media, which is a cesspool. So I want to ask you one more question about President Trump, and then we're going to move on to other things, the Me Too movement. We can't. We can never yes, move on to well, anything. I know. We're addicted. <laughs> nope. We'll talk about the Me Too movement, the Kavanaugh coverage, and, and a bunch it of other things. It all comes back to Trump, believe right. me. Right. So, so here's one last Trump question from a student. 
Margaret, if you could sit down and interview Trump, what is the first thing you'd ask him? Well, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. But I did, um, I did very, uh, I did watch with great interest Leslie Stahl's interview with Trump on 60 Minutes the other day. And, you know, I thought it was a valiant effort on her part to challenge him. But I also was amazed, as I always am, at how he parries things and, and moves on and, and you know, we might, when she said, you know, he said, well, we were going to go to, we were going to war with North Korea, and now we're, now he sends me love letters, or whatever it is he says about that. And, and Leslie Stahl said, we were going to war, and he said, well, you know, we were headed in that direction. And so he may change a little bit. I mean, he's very hard to pin down, and it's very hard to interview him. I mean, look, Lester Holt, did this incredible interview with Trump in which he asked him about why he fired Comey. And, and Trump basically said he had fired him because of the Russia investigation. And he didn't want it, he wanted to get it, it was a cloud over his head. I mean, but it doesn't seem to make any difference. So, you know, it's just like he just moves on. And, 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 and it's fake news. So, um, you know, it's tough. I don't know what my first question would be to him. It's a, it's a good, it's a, certainly a reasonable question to ask, but I, I don't know. Let's talk about Kavanaugh, the Me Too coverage. Yeah, and you've written about this. Your assessment of the, how well or poorly the press covered the whole Kavanaugh controversy. Well, I'm proud of what the Washington Post did because it was, the Washington Post was the place that Christine Blasey Ford uh, turned to the anonymous tip line. She, she got in touch with the Post and said she had this thing she wanted to talk about, but she wanted to be anonymous. And my colleague, Emma Brown, formed a relationship with her, didn't write a word. And then when Ford was ready, felt forced to come forward because she thought she was going to be outed by other news media, it was Emma Brown who told her story with her name attached to it. And even during the hearing, uh, Dr. Ford said that she had developed a relationship of trust with a reporter, and that's who she was talking about. So, I mean, I think the Post's coverage was responsible and appropriate. Um, you know, as you get into what the coverage, for example, of what Michael Avenatti brought forth with his person who said that she, you know, had experience of sexual abuse at Kavanaugh's hands, that stuff was not really nailed down. And I think that it, in the end, it sort of took away from a more credible story. In fact, the New York Times chose not to publish information from the third woman who came forward mm -hmm. because it was uncorroborated. Talk to me about cable television for a second. Mm -hmm. Let's forget about the Washington Post mm -hmm. for just a second mm -hmm. and talk about cable television's role, its influence, yeah. and its coverage of, of, of the Kavanaugh and in general politics. Well, going back to the campaign, you know, CNN, who, you know, Trump absolutely hates CNN, right? He's constantly, you know, criticizing Jim Acosta and saying CNN is the absolute worst and they're fake and this and that. CNN essentially, you know, supported his president, his, his ambitions to become president in every way they possibly could. I mean, they filmed the empty podium before he came out and gave his, his speeches and his rallies. They were, you know, because Trump drives ratings, Trump ca has called himself a ratings machine, and he is. And so, Trump, you know, CNN wanted those ratings, and they covered him in a very credulous way. Um, you know, during the Kavanaugh hearings, you know, it's, it's the usual cable news thing. They're sitting around a table, they're, they're talking. Is there any real light being shed on it? You know, not necessarily. Why does he hate CNN? What do you think? <laughs> I mean, because CNN now tries to be critical. I mean, not, not, not against him, I don't think, but they sort of pitch themselves down the middle that MSNBC is over here and Fox News is over here and CNN tries to kind of be down the middle and you know President Trump really doesn't want any coverage that's down the middle he wants the Fox and Friends 
um, uncritical coverage that's that's going to support him in in what he does. But Obama went to war with Fox at one point, too. So every president doesn't like to be criticized, right? Absolutely. And every president spins and every president lies to some extent. It's just that Trump is just more. He's just more in every way. <laughs> Tell, let's talk about the, the Me Too movement and coverage and some of the challenges it presents mm -hmm. for the news media mm -hmm. in terms of sourcing, in terms of allegation, in terms of controversy. And in your view, how well it is being covered or not being covered and mm -hmm. some of the challenges? Mm -hmm. So the New York Times, of course, broke the big story about Harvey Weinstein just almost exactly a year ago. And then the New Yorker followed up quickly with its own reporting by Ronan Farrow, uh, more about Weinstein. And Weinstein was brought down and then, you know, very quickly all these others, Matt Lauer and Charlie Rose and all these others came down. Well, the reason, you know, people knew about Harvey Weinstein for a long time. The reason that it was, it was nailed down this time is because these women who were victims were willing to put their names and faces and photographs and stories behind, behind it. And um, so I think that coverage has been fine and has been good. Has there been a rush to judgment in some cases? And you know, people talk about due process and have been you know, innocent until proven guilty. I think there's, there's, there is a range of wrongdoing here and not everything is equal. Um, and I understand people's objections to that. But I also think that we're going up against many, many, many years of silence and being silenced. And so it's, it's an important corrective to that and an important reckoning. All right, so I promised I wouldn't do this, but I'm going back to Trump for a second. Um, Everyone always does. <laughs> because I want to ask you about a statement you made in which you said in talking about Trump and the I press. Deny it. You, you deny it, it's fake. You wrote, regrettably, the press itself, maligned and beaten as it is, nevertheless is Trump's invaluable partner in distraction. You want to elaborate on what that means? Yeah, the, the, yes. The, the news media is very distractible. You know, we're always chasing the latest shiny object. And so, uh, you know, whatever, and, and, and President Trump is highly skilled at, at, at distracting us. And so, you know, do we keep our eyes on the ball and do we write about the important things, the things of substance, you know, the, do we write about climate change? Do we write about uh, um, what's, ha you know, I mean, think about the, the whole thing about children being separated from their parents at the border. Well, for a while there, we were very, very, very focused on that and it actually probably changed things a little bit. But we, you know, then something else came up and we moved on. Now, has that situation been fixed? No, it hasn't been fixed. It's just that we've moved on because we're distracted. And so uh, I think the president understands that very well at a sort of cellular gut level. And he, he does, you know, all the time he's criticizing the press and saying how bad they are is also taking advantage of their kind of weaknesses. But you wrote about a column on climate change, right? And said, this really matters. The UN report comes out and says, by 2040, we're all in big, big trouble. Mm -hmm. Malcolm Bowman's here. He's been yelling about this for 30 years. And then you said that the press has to change. It has to transform itself. The country, but the press. For what should the press do? Okay. About climate change? No, about, yeah, about that coverage as an example of something that's crucial. Yeah, see, disappears. Well, mm -hmm. what, what needs to happen? Well, uh, a lot needs to happen. But one of the things that, that, that is, again, a paradox here is that we all know that you know, we should be reading and taking in more news, whether it's on cable or in the evening news or wherever it may be, more stuff that's important, not just the palace intrigue or the silly stuff or the light features. We should, we should be reading about and caring about the big important things. The problem is we're actually not that interested in those things. And that and you know, we, we're kind of interested in a theoretical way, but we're not necessarily interested in reading that particular story. And believe me, news organizations are measuring this stuff all the time. We know what our metrics are. And you know, Chris Hayes, good guy, you know, MSNBC's got his heart in the right place. 
he, he tweeted the other day that every time he's ever devoted a part of a show to climate change, he said, it's been a ratings killer. Well, God forbid, you know. Um, I mean, the ratings and the numbers are extraordinarily important these days. And yet, we also have a public trust. I mean, we're not just businesses. We also have an important public function, and we have to balance those things. But it's the audience's fault. It's everybody's fault, right? I don't blame them. I'm you not that interested in this stuff either. You, uh, <laughs> no, I, I, of course I am. So, but I, but I, I do think we need to change and get more serious and, and more. And we also need to draw the connections where they, you know, we certainly covered, people were mighty interested in, in Hurricane Michael, right? the devastation that it caused to the Florida panhandle, that's an opportunity to talk about climate change too. And so we don't take the opportunities that are there in the things that we care intensely about. Let me ask you two or three very quick questions from the students, then we're gonna throw it open to everybody. Anything you wanna talk about, question. You work at the Washington Post, which is owned by Nash Holdings, a holding company owned by Jeff Bezos. How do you respond to the claim that because of Jeff Bezos' involvement, the Washington Post has been soft in its coverage of Bezos' business practices, such as low pay and long hours for Amazon workers. Do you believe that media outlets being owned by people or companies with strong corporate interest is a good or bad thing for journalism on the whole? Well, that's, well there's a lot of parts to that. I will say that um, I know for a fact that Bezos does not dictate news coverage in any way. He, he never, ever, ever gets on the phone with uh, the opinion side and says, endorse this person, or with Marty Baron and says, please don't run that story, or would you please run this story? That just doesn't happen. Um, and you may say, well, I don't believe that, but I assure you that that's true. Um, now, the New York Times ran a huge investigation of Amazon in which the headline was something like, it used the words brutal workplace um, about the warehouses and everything. Is the Washington Post as likely to do that? Maybe not, you know, maybe not. So I won't say that it has no, we have done tough stories about Amazon. Are we going to do the big, you know, huge, extremely critical, groundbreaking, we're gonna set out to do that piece? Maybe not. Um, I think that corporate ownership of, of news organizations is problematic. Um, some of them, many newspapers these days are owned by hedge funds. These places, they couldn't care less about the public trust. They are trying to harvest the last profits of these news organizations uh, by cutting their staffs, getting the last profits, and closing them or selling them off. I mean, it's heartbreaking. And I'm talking about big newspapers. They own the, Den you know, the Denver Post, uh, the San Jose Mercury News. These were powerhouse newspapers with hundreds and hundreds of reporters who are down to next to nothing. So yeah, I think that's a big problem. And, I, and there's no perfect answer unless you want the whole country to be funded through the government. And that brings its own set of issues. Two more questions. When you were public editor, what was the most common violation of journalistic ethics or mistakes that you observed in your role? So I, I really think the thing that, I, that bothered me the most was the overuse of anonymous sources. Um, I don't think that's really an ethical issue. It's more a journalistic practice issue. I mean, in general, the ethical practices were good. Um, I, you know, I didn't see a great deal. I saw only, a, I, you know, a couple sort of gray area examples of plagiarism, which were dealt with appropriately. Um, it was r certainly very rare. I didn't see examples of fabrication or anything like that. Um, I think that I'd say it was the anonymous sources. And Over why is that happening? Why well, is it? It's know, because we're addicted to, you know, we in the media are addicted to, the, to the stories that come from, from those, from those sources, and it's very hard to walk away from them. And it's, you know, they're a source of, 
They're a source of scoops. They're a source of glory. This is the way we get our great stories. And so to say, well, we're not going to do that anymore is sort of like saying to your competitor, you guys go do all the great stories. We'll just sit here and be virtuous. <laughs> not going to happen. Question from a student. How is your role as a woman journalist? You were the first woman, woman to be the managing editor, the first woman to be the editor, the first woman to be the public editor. How has that impacted your view of male-dominated newsrooms? Well, how much time have you got? <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I've been, often been in my career, especially as an editor, a mid-level editor and a top editor, um, you know, the only woman in the room. Um, you know, at, at, at corporate gatherings, the only woman around the corporate board table. Um, and it's tough. I mean, it's very hard to, to represent your own values or beliefs when you're kind of also trying to be one of the guys. And one of the things that I found, and I know Jill Abramson at the New York Times talked about this too, is that in order to counter that, you have to get enough women at the table so that it's not a singular voice. And so once you reach some kind of critical mass where you get to be almost half somehow, then, you know, it flows a little better. And then the power imbalances tend to go away. But, you know, I, I've been in some, in some not pleasant and some very tough situations. And some of them are, you know, were unacceptable. And I, and I countered them in one way or another. And some you just sort of say, well, you know, I can deal with it. OK. Example? Do you want to talk about any example? That would be? Not really. Not really. <laughs> um, OK. At the end of this presentation, I'm going to, for those of you who are frustrated or uncertain about how you should deal personally with all of the stuff going on in the news media, what's some advice on how you can navigate and make intelligent decisions and decide what is real and what isn't? I'm going to put up at the very end, um, Margaret recently wrote a column with seven kind of guidelines for what you can do to be more intelligent news consumer. So I'll end with that. So you can take that away with you. But right now, we're going to go to questions from you. Who's got questions? Anybody? Just come to the microphone if you've got a question. Tell, tell me your name, if you would, and like what, if you're a student or. Hello, I'm Craig Klein. I'm a journalism student, and I have a question. Um, you exper you um, talked about how you felt like there was something that went, went unchecked. Do you feel that um, like the major newspapers should like gather together and form a kind of newspaper judiciary body, an impartial third party organization that reviews the coverage of the various um, organizations and then takes actions to correct that, similar to how like um, in the early 1800s the Associated Press was formed as a coalition. Do you feel like that in the modern times we need a similar coalition but devoted to making sure that we coverage is done properly? Mm. Does anybody hear the question? The, the question was that should the newspapers get together and form a kind of group that would judge other newspapers and there are councils like this in other countries we don't have in the United States and act as a check for what they would consider bad coverage. Quickly thoughts? Well so I think that we're seeing more collaboration like that and and there are consortiums there's more collaboration on reporting than there ever has been before there's more effort to get together but i have to say that it kind of runs against the dna of news organizations who tend to be fiercely independent and tend to be highly competitive okay we have a lot Thank of people uh, we have a lot of people want to ask questions so i'm going to keep your questions short and We'll do this as kind of a lightning round. OK, go. My name is Sasha Podzorov. I'm a, a little louder in the, in the mic. My name is Sasha Podzorov. I'm a journalism student. Um, with the recent events with the Saudi Arabian government and Trump just releasing a statement saying that here we go again with the guilty and so proven innocent um, statement, uh, how do you think his reaction is? Is it appropriate? And what could be done about this situation? This is the Saudi journalist who has disappeared and may have been murdered, and, and the president saying, we can't be sure that the Saudis necessarily are responsible. Margaret, your thoughts? Well, I mean, you know, all the signs point to um, the journalist who was a columnist for the Washington Post as well, having been murdered at the Saudi embassy. Um, 
it's true there hasn't been a judicial uh, proceeding or a conviction, but the idea that we're just supposed to go, oh, well, you know, maybe these were rogue killers and let's not worry about it and let's get back to our arms deal, I think is, is, um, is an abdication of responsibility. Rebecca, go. Uh, my name is Rebecca. I'm a journalism major here. Um, so it seems like most journalists um, nowadays are active on Twitter and a lot have been criticized for being too vocal with their opinions on social media. And for up and coming journalists like myself, basically our whole lives have been documented online. Right. So do you think this will end up um, jeopardizing our integrity as we enter the fields and like how can we address that? Right. Well, you have to be careful. Um, I, you know, I've done a little bit of teaching in journalism as well, and what I've told my students is remember that when you tweet or po post on whatever, you know, platform you're on, that you are publishing to the world and you're publishing forever. So just because you don't have an editor sitting there saying, you know, maybe you better not do that, you have to be your own editor. And I advise you not to, um, not to give in to the, uh, the uh, social media equivalent of road rage, you know, and, and be, very, be very careful, be very restrained, and, you know, walk away from the keyboard. And know that these things can come back to haunt you because we've seen this happen just in the past year with people's... Uh, tweets from long ago coming back to haunt them and having jobs actually withdrawn. So I think it's a great tool and I think you have to exercise caution and, and be your own editor and when in doubt just, you know, maybe go make a cup of tea or something instead. Question. My name's Irene and I'm a journalism student. Um, so you were talking about earlier in your, in this speech you were saying how like journalists feel like on a Tuesday it's a Friday and how there's like no lid on anything and there's yeah. no weekends anymore. Do you think that's just because of like President Trump or do you think there's just so much going on in the world or do you think it's social media based or? I mean it's a combination of all those things but I really do think that that President Trump is a huge factor um, and that that you know his ability to distract and his desire to distract you know, I think I've read that he, he, he even sort of wakes up with an idea of, you know, kind of like the reality show of the day. How, what, is the, what is the drama or the mini drama or the melodrama of the day going to be and go from there? And we're all sort of held captive to that. But I think the 24-hour news cycle that existed before Trump um, and social media add to it. Okay, next question. Hi, I'm Alex Denuso. I'm a journalism major. So referring to the Kavanaugh trial, Trump has said that the system is now guilty until proven innocent. Do you believe that this is the case with our judicial system, or do you believe that we are just less, le less lenient with some of these problems? So, you know, the thing that uh, I think we've lost sight of a little bit is that, you know, Judge Kavanaugh, now Justice Kavanaugh, wasn't, uh, this was not a criminal trial. And it wasn't a judicial proceeding or a criminal anything. It was a job interview for the highest court in the land forever. So, um, you know, maybe, you know, it's not, it's not the same. You know, you don't have to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt. You, you, the idea was, is this person at the impeccable level that we would want a justice to be at. And I think people lost sight of that and they're comparing apples and oranges. Yes. Uh, hi, my name's Beth. I'm a journalism student here. So you talked a lot about coverage of Trump and whether it was critical or not, but my question is, do you feel that the media today places equal focus on Trump's tweets as well as his actions in office? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I, I think implicit in your question is that we overemphasize his tweets, and I agree with that. I think that, we, you know, on the one hand, the tweets are official presidential statements because he's the president and he can move markets and alienate uh, uh, foreign leaders uh, or do all kinds of things on Twitter, and we have to know that. But I don't think we have to respond to every... It's a witch hunt, you know, tweet like it's a five alarm fire. And we have to bring a little bit of um, critical um, sort of reserve to, to covering tweets. Professor Selvin. Hi, I'm Barbara Selvin. I'm a professor here on the journalism faculty and like you, a member of the Journalism and Women's Symposium. And I want to follow up on Howie's last question about women in journalism. 
Our student body is about 65% women. That's been the case in journalism schools for the last 30 years. And yet in the newsroom, it's about 65% men in newsrooms and even a smaller, far smaller percentage at the top, as you well know and as you discussed. Uh, in one of my favorite columns of yours about the Me Too movement, you wrote, a media figure doesn't have to show up for a business meeting in an open bathrobe to do harm. He can help frame the coverage of a candidate's supposedly disqualifying flaws. He can squelch a writer's promising work. He can threaten an underling's job if she doesn't stay in line and remember who really runs the show around here. Why is it that the, despite the predominance of women in journalism schools over decades, we still are a minority in the newsroom and are not shaping the news coverage in a representative fashion? Um, you know, I, I mean, I think that the business has been, has been dominated by white men. You know, I really like white men, so don't get me wrong, but um, um, for a long time. And I think that it's self-perpetuating in a way. Um, and so there are, you know, we've always heard, oh, well, there are women in the pipeline now. They'll be rising any minute now, and they'll be running things. But it never really seems to happen, and that's true with racial diversity as well. It's always in the pipeline, but the pipeline seems kind of endless. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it takes a lot to break through that, as I, as I know from personal experience. And some women, honestly, don't really want to deal with the negative parts of hanging in there and, you know, and also, frankly, as I did, trying to raise a family uh, while, you're, while you're doing it. And, and that burden, you know, just biologically tends to fall a little bit differently than it does for men. So there's, you know, there's a lot of reasons. I think it's regrettable, um, you know, and, and, and I, I hope it's changing. I, I think it is, but too slowly. Thank you. Rachel. Hey, my name is Rachel again. Um, I have, a lot of my questions are already asked and answered, but um, another important question that I have is, do you believe that now public editors, since there is no official role anymore with the Times or the Post, that it should be coming back? Or how should journalists stand up for each other, whether you're part of the same organization or competing organizations, how do we stand up and make sure that we support and differentiate ourselves from being journalists and the media that is attacked every day? So there's really two questions there. Let me just interrupt by saying that um, a couple of years ago, I guess it was more than a couple, after you left, the Times ended um, the position of public editor. The Post ended public editor. Very few, if almost no organizations have it. So you might speak about why they did it, and to answer the first part of that question, why they did it and what your thoughts are and whether we need them more than ever. And we can deal with the second part. Uh, well, you know, I think news organizations have, have always uh, have found it difficult to have these annoying people who are public editors around criticizing them from inside. You know, who would want that? Um, uh, and so when it, you know, when economic pressures meant that they were laying off reporters or doing buyouts of reporters, you know, it was, uh, it was an excuse, I think, to say, you know, if we're going to keep people on staff, we're going we're to put that into our, reporting, uh, our, into our reporting staff, not into uh, a public editor, because they would say, there's so much criticism on social media and from a million critics out there, we've got plenty of criticism, we will answer the criticism, and that will do the job. But of course, that's not true, um, because those people who are tweeting about something cannot go to Dean Becquet and get an answer and present it back to the readership. So I think something has been lost with the demise of the role, and I don't expect it to come back. The Thank irony you. is that the news media needs to be more transparent to explain how it works and to answer to the public more than ever to restore this kind of trust. And at, in this time, there are no representatives for the readers doing that at all. That's right. Okay, Only at next NBA. question. Hi, how you doing? Uh, my name is Vinny. I'm a journalism major. Uh, so I was wondering from a journalistic perspective, uh, how is the way that President Trump tweets affected politics? Uh, and do you think it's a good thing that this is the way that uh, most millennials get their uh, political information? Uh, and following that, have uh, political journalists had to cope in any way due to the way that he tweets? So, um, 
you know, again, I think we probably pay a little too much attention to his tweets, but from his perspective, it's a fabulous way to get around the gatekeeper role that the press has always had. You know, in the past, it's been, well, if you wanted to, if you wanted to get news out there, you had to go through the press. He can take it directly to the people and particularly directly to his base. So it's a highly, highly effective uh, tool for him and one that I think any politician who's going to uh, run against him or compete in the future is going to have to embrace. Although it's not totally new. I mean, Franklin Roosevelt went on radio, right? Yeah. So it's a matter of degree now. And That's it's true. It's a matter of the ecosystem in terms of how we're getting stuff. Next question. Hi, I'm Allie. I'm a journalism student, and I'm also from Buffalo, so I've been reading the Buffalo News in my life. And I was just wondering how the Buffalo News prepared you for working at a more nationally read paper like the Times mm -hmm. or the Post. Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, I mean, really, really well. I, I felt like, you know, when I walked into the New York Times, I felt extremely well prepared to do that job because I had been in just about every position at the, at the paper. I'd been summer intern all the way up through top editor. And even though you'd say, well, the Buffalo News can't be anything like the New York Times, it, in fact, newspapers, in, you know, I have found are very similar in the way they run things. And so I felt confident and well prepared and, um, and you know, not at all like um, I, w I didn't feel daunted. I felt comfortable and confident and I do attribute that to what I learned in Buffalo. Okay, next question. Hello, how are you? Uh, my name is Matt. I'm a journalism student also. And my question is, considering that politics and the media uh, have become more intertwined than ever and access to that media is now easier than ever before due to social media and other technological advancements, what do you say to college students that are uninformed or otherwise uninterested in consuming political news? I mean, is anybody uninterested in political news right now? I mean, to me, one of the things, one of the good things that's happened and there haven't been that many good things that have happened, let's face it. But one of the good things that have happened is that people really are very interested in politics right now. And they also understand that their vote is meaningful and that, that involvement in politics and coverage of politics is meaningful and that it affects our lives. So I think a journalism student who's not interested in political news might want to look at a different field. So you you, you think this is long lasting? You think post Trump that in a strange way all of this tumult will be good for democracy and for the press in the long run? You know, Trump says that, uh, he's, he says about the New York Times, you know, which he has a terrible relationship with, he says, uh, they're going to endorse me because they love me so much because I drive their numbers up. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's some truth to that. Um, I, you know, I, Will there, I think, will it ever go back to the way it was? No, I don't think so, because I think our culture has changed, too. But will democracy be stronger or weaker from all this? <laughs> That's a tough question. I mean, I'm worried. I, I think that we're in trouble in some ways, and I'm heartened in other ways. I mean, I, there's this expression, um, optimism of the will and pessimism of the intellect. You know, pessimism of the intellect means you say, oh my gosh, it's so terrible, this will never be right. And optimism of the will says we have to do everything we can, even though we know it's bad, in order to change things and, and, and make it better. Okay. So that's how I think about that. Next question. Uh, hi, uh, Jake Meyer, uh, journalism major. Um, in what ways have your thoughts on President Trump changed since you've been covering him like more mm -hmm. in depth? And also, do you think the public opinion has changed due to his like entertainment value? Mm. Everybody hear that question? So the question was, what is Margaret, how does Margaret feel about Trump in terms of now that she's covered him and other issues, um, has, has her opinion changed um, about Trump? Etc. Go ahead. I mean, I don't actually think it's changed that much. I mean, it has been amazing to me to see all these events happen, and it's shocking. I mean, I can still, you know, today when President Trump uh, tweeted about Stormy Daniels and referred to her as horseface in his tweet, I mean, I still find I have this, I have the ability to be shocked still, which I, you know, I'm surprised in some ways that, like, after all this time, I'm still shocked. Um, but I think that basically everybody has dug into their, to their corners a little bit more. Um, 
you know, I think Trump's base is still solidly behind him. The so-called resistance is even more of a resistance, and there's probably less in the middle than there was before. Okay, question. Hello, my name is Dylan Ramsey. I'm a journalism student. Uh, since 2016, Don, since when Trump took over in 2016, liberal and conservative-minded people have collided on their political views on the news. Have question, collided on? On their political views on the news. Do you believe those political views have affected what truth is in this country? What was the last part of the question? I couldn't hear that either. Do you? I got. Uh, has has all have, you know? We we keep hearing about this post truth, and I'm not sure what that means. But we've got all of this polarization, and people not accepting the other point of view. Is the definition of truth or the notion of what we're going to? Mm -hmm. Except this truth yeah. changing. Well, you know, really, even though we couldn't hear you that well, you've probably asked the most important question. Um, and, and, you know, I think we have to hang on to factual reality really tight. Um, th there's a lot of conflicting information out there. There's a lot of um, effort to confuse us. There's a lot of effort to th sort of muddy the waters. And I think if we're going to survive as a democracy, we have to... Uh, not allow ourselves to be gaslighted, and we have to uh, and we have to hang on to what we know is the case because it's verifiable reality, and the press plays a hugely important role in that. Okay, we're going to have, and I apologize for everybody. I don't know if we're going to get through everybody. We'll get to a couple of more questions. Go ahead. Okay, so my name is Paul Feinberg, and I'm just the average to talk at citizen. <laughs> um, we like you. Yeah. And I had spent uh, a good part of my career in public education, and one of the motivations and Just goal, speak a little louder. One, one of the goals of uh, myself and staff was instill, to instill character mm. in an individual with regard to their behavior and teach them about how their behavior affects others and attempt to have someone leave the school with a, a, a sense of character and do the right thing. Mm -hmm. I'm perplexed as to how this guy gets a pass on not questioning the behavior that he displays and the effect that it's having on other people. So I'm going to interrupt for a second. Is the question, do you believe the press is giving the president a pass on this? Yes. So you don't think the press is doing a good job? I don't think the press is addressing the fellow's behavior mm. and the effect that the behavior is having on others. OK, he, Margaret. I, he, he has demonstrated. Not false news. I've seen it come out of his out of his mouth. He's demonstrated racist behavior, sexist behavior, has not produced his tax returns, screwed people out of the university that he supposedly had. What? Right. Why doesn't he get called on it? Okay, okay. So I'm just going to well, right, interrupt and get to the heart of the question. Yeah, no, no, has no. Has the press done a good job on that? I mean, you know. I I guess what I would respond is, how do you know about those things? I see them yes. on TV. OK. You see them because the press is reporting on them. No, no, no. I see him speaking. OK. OK. I, I, I do think that, that the best of the news media is, is telling the public about these things. And I also think that Trump is right when he said in the, during the campaign that he could go out into the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and it wouldn't matter to his base. He said that, There's right. a section of the country that doesn't, wouldn't believe anything bad and will accept whatever he does, you know, for reasons that are a little bit beyond me. But, but I do think we're telling people about them. I think we're pointing it out. We don't always use the words racism and sexism and lies because we're trying to present it in, you know, kind of the neutral language of journalism. Next question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Daimeli Rodriguez. I'm taking a journalism class. 
I was wondering how much of the press you think is credible. Um, I was talking to my brother a couple days ago, and he told me he doesn't tune into certain networks because he feels like some of them are too liberal or too conservative. So I was wondering, mm -hmm. like, which networks you think are the least biased mm -hmm. and the most credible? Question was about credibility of the press. Uh, you know, one of the problems, as you know, Margaret, when you talk about the press, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of news outlets. So to try to generalize is almost impossible. But the credibility of the press, you yeah. know, is there, is, there, is there a lot of bias in some of the news outlets that's very apparent to you, um, and including outlets that maybe pretend that there is no bias and trying to be straightforward? So I think that uh, your brother is, is right in many ways that, um, that there are a lot of news outlets and media organizations out there that aren't very trustworthy. And that the, you know, and he also gave you some good advice in saying, check out other, check out other ones as well. And I think that you do well when you kind of have a broad knowledge and, and a broad um, exposure to different news organizations and you can kind of compare and contrast them against each other. But they're not all created equal and some are, you know, news organizations have a good reputation or a bad reputation for a reason. If you ask people, you know, even the whole American public what they think of Breitbart News, it's down at the bottom in terms of credibility. The, 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 the Wall Street Journal is way up high. You know, in the end, people do know uh, what's credible and what's not. And none of those are flawless, uh, but I think that you have to develop some people that you like to follow and some news organizations that, you know, you have found to be trustworthy and also read broadly and read and watch broadly. Multiple sources, multiple sources. Yep. Question. Hi, my name is Kelly Alrado, and I'm a dual major in journalism as well as women's studies. And as you know, President Trump is known for disliking the media as well as belittling women. Um, he recently had an interaction with a uh, reporter named Cecilia Vega and said that she doesn't think. Um, are you scared of any backlash you might receive from Trump? Um, and do you think it could be worse since you are a woman in the media? So I think that his... You want to repeat the question? Yeah. You know, is Trump worse with women than he, than he, than he is with men? And... Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I haven't had any, you know, I'm not in the gaggle, I'm not in the press briefing room, but Cecilia Vega, um, a White House correspondent for one of the major TV networks, you know, he insulted her uh, out of nowhere and said, you know, you're not a thinking person or something like that. I mean, I think that's terrible and I, it's, it's sexist and it's wrong. You know, but she's a pro, and she kind of moved on from there. And I think that that's what, that's what my boss, Marty Barron, says when he says we're not at war, we're at work. So I think we have to kind of buckle down and do the work and try to let some of this stuff roll off our back. Question. Uh, I'm Warren Strugach, and I write a pair of business columns for Long Island Press Magazine, and I'm an arts columnist at the New York Times. And first, uh, thank you for your comments. Um, I'd like to know that, uh, in my opinion, a, uh, a public editor performs a role that's not dissimilar from quality control in an industrial process, a kind of a journalistic version in many ways. Um, if you were going to cite your biggest accomplishment in terms of quality control during your stint as public editor, what would it be? And if I can double dip briefly, if you were asked to argue for the reinstatement or even the expansion of that position at the New York Times, or any other publication, how would you defend the role of public editor as, as helping journalism, journalism's bottom line and its image? Okay, so uh, thank you. Um, great questions and I'll try to go quickly on them. Um, I would say that I, because I wrote so much about the overuse of anonymous sources and there were a couple of really bad examples while I was there of anonymously sourced stories that were wrong and required huge corrections or editor's notes, the Times, during my tenure, toward the end of the tenure, did actually tighten up their guidelines on the use of anonymous sources uh, in a very productive way. And I was, I mean, they didn't say, and because the public editors said so much about it, we're doing this, but I knew that I was a part of that and I was proud of it. And if I were to make an argument for the reinstatement of the public editor, it would be that if we, you know, these days, our 
our consumers, our news consumers, our, our audience, our readers are the people who are paying the bills for us now. It's not the advertisers as much anymore. So if, if we're not serving them in every way we can, um, in a transparent way and in a responsible way, uh, how can we expect to be successful business people? Or businesses. Thank you. So we got five minutes or four minutes. We've got six questions, okay? So I'm going to count on you to really go zero fast. in, distill your question, quick answer, go. Hi, I'm Shelby Green. I'm a journalism student. And how do you think that the world of media is going to change once Trump leaves office? Well, I think we're going to have, you know, news organizations are starting to deal with this a little bit. There's going to be less readership. There's going to be less intense interest because a lot of people are terrified he's taking down the democracy. Some people are entertained by him. Some people love him to death, but he commands attention. And we're going to have to deal with that fact that things might be a little more boring. So people are not boring so that we're going to have fewer news consumers. They will maybe. We don't know. Question. Hi, I'm Jasmine Watson. I'm a journalism major, and I just wanted to know, as a public editor, how important, like, how important is it to strike the balance between what you think that the readers should know versus what they want to read? Mm. Right. So the, the comparison I use is uh, that people always say that they want substance, and we're always giving them, you know, this frothy stuff or like gossipy stuff. And it's a little bit like you say that you really like broccoli, but when it comes right down to it, you'd rather have that hot fudge brownie sundae or something like that. And I think that we have to, we, we have to remember that in the end, our major role is to hold government accountable and to inform citizens so they can make intelligent decisions about how they're governed and stay as close to that as possible. Thank you. Question. Hey there, I'm Matt Reynas. I'm a journalism student. Um, you talked about how Trump essentially used Twitter in order to like sidestep the media's role as a gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. Do you think that after his success, you're going to find more politicians using similar tactics? And do you think that the media can do anything to avoid letting them take control of the narrative? You know, I, I, I don't actually think we can. You know, we're not going to put the social media uh, genie back in the bottle. I don't know that everyone will use it as relentlessly as Trump does, but I don't think things are going to go back to like, well, let's have a press conference or try to feed this story to this reporter. It's, it's out there and it's not going to change. Okay, next question. Uh, hi, my name is Sarah Beckford, I'm a journalism major. So in talking about um, how news organizations may own well, media organizations may own papers and things like that. Mm -hmm. How do we as journalists maintain journalistic integrity and provide context to our readers, especially in a time where the public doesn't trust us? What was the, the last part of the question? I know you want to ask how journalists can maintain their integrity. Yeah. How do we maintain that integrity and provide context in our stories when we're not being trusted by the public? Uh. Well, I mean, that's, you know, it, the question, it's, Margaret, quickly, yeah. because so uh, when the public doesn't trust us, how can we maintain integrity and how can we regain that trust? I mean, it's a really complicated question and I've been, it's probably the thing I've thought about the most. I don't have an easy answer. I think that we have to do our jobs better. We have to figure out how to deal with this new environment, which is all digital. Um, we have a lot of challenges and, you know, I think we could form a closer relationship with our readers and listen to them more and also be more transparent about how we do our jobs, that might help. Okay, last question on this side. Hi, I'm Sarah Ruberg. I'm a journalism major. Um, I, as a part of your job, you critique the media. And so what is something that my generation of reporters can bring um, to change the way um, reporting is done now? Well, I mean, I think that you guys, <laughs> know how to, you know, you are digital natives, you grew up in this world, and you don't have to learn how to deal with this new world of technology and communication. It, you, it's the water around you. you, you know how to do it. And I think that knowledge is going to help us in the long run. Okay, next. My name is Danielle Chartrand, I'm a business major. Uh, my question is, regarding Trump, would you say that the media is more likely to focus on a story against him because it goes with the current media's talking point versus publishing a story about what he's actually doing for the country in fear of losing the current following they have. What was the question? So would a newspaper sway a certain way, like even if the story is not as important um, to be against him than it is to be for him because of the following that they have? 
Okay, so the question I think is, will a newspaper basically slant its coverage based on its readers if they feel the readers are pro or anti-Trump, will that affect the news coverage? Does that happen or should it happen? In other words, will they play to their readership in that sense? I mean, it does seem as though most of these news organizations now have a very specific audience, you know? MSNBC and Rachel Maddow, she knows who she's talking to, and so does Sean Hannity, and boy, those are not the same people, um, you know, not at all. And, you know, that's why I think it's so important to, to kind of go across and, and get a cross-section so that you're not just getting one point of view. Last question. Um, my name is Chris Kaloris, and I'm a journalism minor. And my question was, just to round off the presentation, do you have any last minute tips for aspiring, aspiring journalists on how to remain objective and level-headed when delivering a story in a political climate that appears to not? Question, how do journalists advice about how you can remain level-headed and objective in a political climate if you're a journalist that's so charged and so polarized? So I, I think, you know, what I always come back to is, is the question and even the word fairness. You know, not so much objectivity, because I think that gets kind of messed up, you know. Uh, objectivity can end up meaning, well, half this and half that, and then you're into this question of false equivalency. I think if you think about fairness and actually serving the interests of your reader, that that can keep you, you know, kind of really focused on what's important, and it can be kind of a core that never deserts you. Right. So, Margaret, let's just take a look. You want to you go to the slide? Josh, you want to go to the slide? So, Margaret recently wrote a column on seven ways that you can deal with the current media environment. If you're a news consumer and you want to try to be better at understanding what you can trust, so I'm going to ask you to turn and just talk about each one of these, okay? One at a time. Yes. Uh, well, I think this one is sort of self-explanatory. One of the things that happens uh, frequently is that I see people, I mean, I'm on Twitter a lot, and I see people uh, tweeting out a story before they could possibly read it. And usually they're reacting to a headline or they're bringing their own point of view to the general subject and, you know, saying, well, you never talked about this. And you want to say to them, well, actually, if you would have read it, you would have found out that I did deal with that. So uh, read it before you share it. It's kind so of studies show that 50% of people retweet without ever opening up the link, just based on what they get from their friend and just the, the, the couple of messages. They just send that on to other people. Just think about that. Think about your own life, by the way, all of you who are getting texts from friends and relatives and then pass it on to other people without checking out that information. I get it from my brother-in-law all the time. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, in a nice way, I send it back to him and say, this is bogus. I mean, you have a responsibility to do that every day. Every day you get something, you shouldn't share it or pass it on without verifying it. So know your source. I'm not talking about your source as a journalist, but here your source of news information. So um, if you have... You know, I share a lot of things on, on social media and, and, and elsewhere. You have to know who it's coming from. Is this a trustworthy source? Is it someone who tends to get things right or tends to get things wrong? And, you know, know something about who you're talking about and who you're, who you're I mean, I don't really know what I was getting at here, honestly. <laughs> I'm, there was a paragraph of explanation with each of these things. <laughs> this which, is without context. I mean, I you know, it was like at least two weeks ago, so it's in the... All right, third. Forgotten it all. Um, okay, so what I mean here is that we have to bring a lot of skepticism to everything we read and everything we encounter. And we have a tendency to say, well, I agree with that, so it must be true. And what I'm saying here is... If something feeds into your preconceived idea, bring even more skepticism to it and be a critical reader. And that's not easy because there's a tendency for all of us to want to get information that supports our point of view. We teach lots of students news literacy here. This is one of the biggest barriers, staying open. You've got to practice and you've got to work at it. Um, so many times, especially in a breaking news story, let's say, uh, 
uh, you know, a terrible school shooting or something like that. There is going to be a lot of misinformation in the early rounds of that story in the first couple hours. It's going to be a lot that's wrong. There's multiple gunmen. Uh, they've got the guy. They don't have the guy. You know, number of deaths, um, all kinds of things. Um, they are going to be corrected. Don't take those things as gospel. This is a developing story. And the best news organizations, and I see NPR doing this to good effect, is, saying, is actually saying in their story, this is a developing story. There's a lot we don't know. Uh, we will update this. You know, this is a developing story. We're updating as we go along. I mean, that's very useful. So uh, on cable news, um, and this is, this is certainly true on CNN, um, you know, many of these people are paid pundits, and the ones, some of them are, you know, essentially unable to bring anything other than the message they, you know, they, it, the Trump surrogates in particular are, they, they're under, they're basically under orders, uh, sometimes written non-disclosure non -disclosure agreements where they can't say anything critical. Um, and so you need to know that when you hear them talk, they're not actually giving you some sort of balanced point of view. So how do you know who's who? Well, that's, you know, the cable networks don't do a good job of explaining that, and so you have to approach it all with a lot of, you know, I think if you watch it over time, I mean, Jeffrey Tubin is not one of those guys, but uh, Kaylee McInerney, or whatever her name is, is. Um, and, you know, if, if, you, if you over time realize they do nothing but praise the president or whatever it is they're doing, you, you know, you can find out that way. So compare and contrast is something I talked about before. Um, make sure that you're reading and taking in information across the political spectrum, not just what comes across your Facebook feed or your social media or what your friends seem to like, but actually stuff that you might disagree with and don't rely on one source too much. All right, last one. Take a break. Um, I think what I said here, and this was during the Kavanaugh hearings, you know, or is it the lead up to them, you know, some of us tend to be too glued to our phones, too glued to the news. We're freaking out about it. We're getting depressed. You know, do something else and then come back to it refreshed. Yeah, don't read the news before you go to bed at night. It's just very, it's very bad. You won't sleep well. I'm going to end by reading something that Margaret wrote that I think distills everything that she probably believes, but I may be wrong. It was the end of a column she wrote about Kavanaugh, and this is what she said. Legitimate journalists and respectable news organizations get things wrong, no doubt. They make factual errors and almost always correct them. They damage their own credibility by blurring the line between opinion and news. They are highly distractible. They are guilty of tunnel They are guilty of tunnel vision, arrogance, and groupthink. Even so, they might be American democracy's best hope at the moment. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.